One, two, three, four. Hey, we're sound checking. Good evening, Christ Church. Welcome to Going Deeper. I'm so glad to be with you here tonight. My name is Lindsay, and this is my husband, Andy, and we'll be hosting the service tonight. During worship, we would love to pray with you if you would like prayer. So you can come up here and pray, but also this side is always open if you want to come up and pray by yourself. You can also pray at your seat. If you're online, you can pray at home. We want to say hello to you guys online, too. Andy is going to pray for the service. Dear Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this church and these people. I pray that you would bless us tonight. Help us to be open to your word and to the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit would just descend on this place and, and fill, fill our hearts. Be with us as we worship. Help us to have open hearts to you. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
trust in you alone and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I Praise the 
cross that you bore and the debt that you paid for the victory you won over death and the grave. This is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for. The cross that you bore in the debt that you paid for the victory you won over death and the grave. This is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me. you into this space tonight. Lord, as we continue to sing, as we prepare to hear your word, won't you you keep our focus in the here and now. May everything that's happening outside of these four walls just fade away. Speak to us. Willing, we're ready. Lord, bless these tithes, bless these offerings as we prepare to give. Use them to strengthen your church, to reach those who are searching, to strengthen those who believe. We give you praise. We praise you in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you'd like to give, there are some bowls in the front and the back. If you're watching online, there's a link you can click.
Amen. The scripture tonight comes from Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Take a moment to say hello to one another. God is good all the time. time. Welcome to everybody at our CM campus, at our Milstadt campus, and of course, everybody who joins us online. I would like to just open up by offering praise to God for some things. You know, I ask you to pray about things, and sometimes we ask people to pray, and then we forget to tell people how it turns out. And, And sometimes we think, well... Uh, You know, I I don't want to make people think I'm calling attention to myself. If we've prayed and God answers the prayer, we're calling attention to God, not us. We're calling attention to God, not us. So a couple of things I wanted to to share with you. First of all, everybody that was on the launch team for my new book, That's Good News, on Facebook, I want to say thank you. We were hoping for about two to 300 people. We ended up with 450 people 
on that launch team. They helped get stuff out, spread word about the book. So I just want to say a personal thank you and all of you online, I want to thank you as well. We, we ran into a problem yesterday on the book release day, the formal book release day. Uh, when the pre-orders came out on Amazon, and on Amazon, the book had a glitch in it and the cover didn't load. So if you looked on Amazon, by the book, that's good news. It said no image available, which is really, really attractive. It's like an album that the cover of the album says no image available. They tried and tried to get it fixed. And finally, we were pretty sure that we were just going to have to go into uh, launch day with no cover on the book. On launch day morning, I checked about 5 till 8 in the morning that we were going to kick everything off. The cover was not there. I checked again at 8 o'clock, and bam, the cover was there. So for those of you that prayed, it's a little thing, but thank you. I also wanted to give praise to God, because both in pre-release and yesterday on launch day, uh, That's Good News hit number one on Kindle. It hit number one on Amazon on their 100 hot bestsellers kind of list. For church growth, they hit number one in evangelism. They hit number one for Christian discipleship off and on. So praise God for all of that. Thank you for all of you. Uh, Support your prayer. Again, my goal in this has never been to sell books. My goal in this is to get an evangelism movement launched because I hear the Spirit of God saying the church needs to turn its heart back to Jesus and back toward evangelism. And I tell God all the time, Lord, if you are wanting to send a revival, and right now you're following what's going on at Asbury University, I'm saying, Lord, if you want to send a revival, I'm volunteering us to be the evangelistic wing. All right? I'm, I'm volunteering us to be that evangelistic wing. I see God doing some incredible things. And when I looked on those bestseller lists and all of those things, I mean... I looked at the top 10. I was the only author I had never heard of. And so (laughs) only God can do that kind of thing. So thank you and praise God. And thank you to all of you who have helped promote, helped get word out. And most of all, helped get this thing in the hands of people. I do wanna let you know, we do have some copies of this in the bookstore. After church tonight, the bookstore is actually gonna stay open. And I'm going to swing in for about 15 minutes. If anybody would like one of these signed to them, personalized in any way, if you want to give it to somebody, please uh, do that. I'm happy to do that. So right after church, I'll be in the bookstore for about 15 minutes if you would like to pick one of those up. Also wanted to invite you to one of our book studies. We are going to mobilize this church into an evangelistic machine for the Lord over the next two years. That's, that's the vision. And when it comes to evangelism, you gotta answer some questions. Number one, why should people evangelize? Because most Christians don't. And you can say, well, you should, but why? Why should people evangelize? Number two, what is the gospel message? You'd be surprised how many Christians have no real idea. And number three, how do you effectively evangelize? Well, we wanna teach you how to do all of those things. So we're gonna have a series of small groups, five-week studies. I think Pastor Carmen's teaching one, uh, Mike's teaching one, uh, Kevin Siddle's teaching one, but we're gonna have a series of studies. Some of your small groups are gonna take this on for these weeks as a study, but we're just gonna equip our people in how to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And I will say this, it all begins, and it will all begin, when the American church decides once and for all the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. Always has been, is now, always will be, and who doesn't want to share good news? So that's what we're looking at. So I uh, invite you to do that. Those of you that are ebook people, uh, Kindle has done really, really well, and those can be instantly downloaded now. I've also been asked about an audio version. We do not have one. Our publisher does not have that. But I found out today that if you download the Kindle book and say, Siri, read this, it will read you the Kindle book. So in a sense, it is an audio book. And if if you are happy to have Siri read it, and the cool thing about Siri is they can read male or female voice in any accent you want. So awesome. So all of those things. Last thing I want to share is my friend Babette. You guys know Babette. Babette wife. There she is. She went to Israel on the pilgrimage with us. 
She said that she believed that God was going to heal her at the pool of Bethesda outside of St. Anne's Church in Jerusalem. She had been suffering with her back. She'd been suffering with neuropathy. She'd been suffering with a lot of things. And I got to tell you, there's no way to tell you how hard the devil tried to take her out of that trip. She, I mean, there was a point she was so ill. I was just hoping we could get her on the airplane in five days. God instantly turned that thing around. When we got to that prayer day, she was there at the pool. We laid hands on her, and she told me before church tonight that her neuropathy is gone, the pain is gone, and she's been standing upright in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Folks, if we're going to pray for people and God touches them, we better start shouting it from the housetops. This is good news, and this is the kind of stuff we need to share. All right. Welcome to week four of our verse-by-verse trek through Philippians. We are still at the trailhead. Sorry. (laughs) For the past three weeks, we've looked at Acts 16 to recount the circumstances and conditions surrounding the initial planting of the church in Philippi. And it was to that church that Paul wrote Philippians. It's Paul's second missionary journey. It's 49 AD. Winter. Prompted by the Holy Spirit in the form of a vision... Paul's trip is going like this. He goes through his hometown here at Tarsus, Derby, Lystra, Antioch. Now we're going to be in this area where we're going to be going on pilgrimage uh, at the end of next year. Uh, I guess the year, yeah, 2024. We'll be going on pilgrimage here. Then he gets up into here, and all of a sudden God says, you keep pushing west. Paul changes his itinerary, goes to Troas, crosses the Aegean Sea, and pushes into Greece. The first town you get to inland is Philippi. So that is where the book of Philippians comes from. We're doing the uh, story that lets you know how the church was founded. Once in Philippi, Paul discovers what I'm going to call some Jewish-leaning Gentile women, and they're praying by a small river outside the city. This is me there. That's the small river outside of Philippi. And so they are praying at that river. Uh, Paul shares the gospel with them because Paul thought the gospel was good news. He shares the gospel with them. They, uh, they receive Christ. And among the people who receive Christ is a strategic individual. Her name is Lydia. She is a seller of purple. She is, on, she is a successful business person. I mean, she's a who's who kind of business person who's in the fashion industry on the textile end. They dye things, and she gets saved. How's that for some good old language? She gets good and saved. And before long, she, the other women, her whole household, they all come to Jesus. The evangelistic team now has a headquarters, and they continue to join Lydia and the rest of the women for prayer regularly at the river. Now it's time to move to the next step of evangelism. A lot of times we intend to evangelize, but we never quite get to it. We say, well, I want to build a relationship first. And we have all kinds of friends, but we've never invited them to Jesus. Paul's ready to evangelize. So he goes on into the city. Philippi's pretty easy because uh, Philippi's in ruins now. There's not a city on top of it. So we know exactly where it was, and they can dig down to the right level. So he goes to the city, he starts reaching out, begins sharing the gospel, and then something unexpected happens. A demonic slave girl fixates upon the group. And everywhere they go, she says, these men are servants of God and they're going to tell you how to get saved. Well, it's true, but she is fixated on them. And finally, she gets on Paul's last nerve. And he gets so mad, he casts out the demon in frustration. Anybody ever cast out a demon because you were annoyed? I didn't think so, but Paul did. (laughs) This girl is instantly set free. When her handlers saw that Paul had let their cash cow out of the barn, they began to rouse the rabble. They made strong public accusations against Paul and Silas for promoting things un-Roman. They leaned into a little anti-Semitism that would have already been there anyway, and before long, they started a riot. Local authorities were forced to intervene, and they had Paul and Silas, the ringleaders, that's what they always did, the Romans, they'd go get the ringleaders. They had them arrested, whipped, and incarcerated. 
And then verse 25 and 26, about midnight, while Paul and Silas were singing hymns. They are in prison. It is midnight. They have had the daylights beat out of them. They have been whipped. They are bloody messes. It's midnight. They are singing hymns. An earthquake hit the city. The doors flew open, and the chains came loose from the walls of the jail. And once again, things are getting interesting. And with Paul, things are always interesting. Verse 27 through 31, the jailer awakened and drew his sword to kill himself. And Paul said, stop, we're all here. A Roman jailer who had prisoners escape on his watch had failed in the execution of his duty. Their orders were to keep prisoners incarcerated until they received further instruction. And if those prisoners escaped for any reason, it was on the jailer, plain and simple. We also know the Roman Empire had little tolerance for failure, mainly none. In such a case, where a jailer let prisoners get away, it was expected that the person responsible would do the honorable thing and commit suicide. From the Roman perspective, suicide saved everyone a lot of paperwork, a lot of time, and a lot of embarrassment. Under normal circumstances, if a jail became breached, it was a certainty that the incarcerated would try to escape. Because in the first century, if you could get enough distance between you and minor trouble, it probably wasn't going to chase you down. You notice these days, really nobody gets away with stuff that breaks out of prison. They eventually find them all, almost every single time. And that's because they continue to use their cell phones and whatnot, which, which isn't really the best thing possibly to do. But I'm just saying, when people escape from prison, you just hit the stopwatch. They almost always are going to get them. Back in the first century, if you could get some distance between you and trouble, it probably isn't going to chase you down. The jailer just assumed an earthquake-aided jailbreak uh, without so much as checking the cells. So just as he has pulled out a dagger, he's about to run himself through, Paul cries out to him. And he says, we are all here. Uh, These were not normal circumstances. And what I want you to hear is when you're sharing faith in Christ under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you won't be in normal circumstances either. You're going to find that God will bend circumstances in the favor of the gospel being proclaimed. That's what Paul's finding. And get ready to go to the New Orleans Mardi Gras. While they are there, they will have occasions where God will bend circumstances so that the gospel may be proclaimed. Trembling with fear, the jailer asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. I want you to imagine the jailer's point of view. He locks up prisoners after a riot. He goes to sleep. He's awakened by an earthquake. He sees the jail has been breached. He decides to commit suicide. He calls off the suicide. This all probably happens in two minutes flat. You talk about sensory overload. And yet what's amazing to me, even in this state, he not only keeps his wits about him, he asks the single best question that's ever been asked in the cosmos. He's never been so sharp. What is the single most important question that's ever been asked? What must I do to be saved? There's no more important question. No more important question. If you're alive, there's no more important question. If you're going to die and we're all going to die, there's no more important question. It's the single most important question. What must I do to be saved? Anywhere in the Bible, when someone directly asks that question, I really pay close attention. I'm interested in that, right? I'm interested in that. What is it the Bible says in response? And Paul's direct answer is believe on the Lord Jesus. So we have to unpack that, right? Believe on what? He doesn't really say believe in. He really says believe on. Believe on the Lord Jesus. What do we believe? First of all, we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. We believe in Easter. We are Easter people. We believe that. You take that out, Christianity is a religion among religions. You put that in, we serve a risen Savior. Jesus is alive. That is a unique claim 
among religions concerning its leader. We believe Jesus is alive. He is risen from the dead. What else do you got to believe? That Jesus has the power to forgive sin and to make us right with God. And he has the power to do this. So we got to believe that Jesus is who he said he is and that he can do what he said he can do. That's what we have to believe upon. Now, the Greek word translated believe is pistuo. And it is a verb that isn't about intellectual assent. It's complete reliance on something. I'm going to say it one more time. It's a verb that does not signify credence or intellectual assent. It is total reliance on something. So, pistuo is this. A hang glider has to really believe in his hang glider before he jumps off a cliff. Your life is supported by this. And if this doesn't work out, things are not going to go well for you. They're not going to go well for you. This kind of belief is to bet your life on something. But what we're really talking about here with the jailer, it's more than your life because it was already a life or death situation. The guy's getting ready to kill himself. It's not betting your life. It's betting your eternity on something. Christians bet our eternity on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We bet our eternity on it. There are a lot of people today who offer intellectual assent to the tenets of the gospel they know the general story. They know Christmas. They know Easter. They know a few of the New Testament's greatest hits. But the story has not fully become their story. They know it, but they don't own it. They have it in their heads, but it's not captivated their hearts. They have it, but it doesn't have them. I think you could correctly say they cognitively believe, but since they do not fully rely upon it, it remains theoretical and it fails to be transforming. Paul is calling upon the jailer to completely, totally, and right now believe upon the gospel of Christ. Bet your eternity on this. And he did just that. Verses 32 following. Then they shared the word with him and all who lived in the household. The jailer then cleaned their wounds, gave them something to eat, and his entire household was baptized. That's cool. Luke is the author of Acts. And for Luke, when people meet Jesus, they start treating other people really well. I guess this trite jailer didn't treat Paul and Silas particularly well, right? He was just having a normal night. They ruined his whole night because they couldn't behave themselves in public. I'm not thinking a jailer had great sympathy on Paul and Silas. But when people receive Christ... They start treating other people really, really well. See, I don't have to agree with everything you think to be kind to you. I don't have to agree with your politics. I don't have to agree with your sensibilities. I don't have to agree with your lifestyle. But I can still treat you really, really well by allowing the Jesus who lives in me love you through me. Becoming Christian does not just change your eternal destiny. It also changes us. This parallels Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. You remember the unlikely hero in the story was the one who actually did something when somebody was beaten and in need. Paul and Silas were beaten and in need. The jailer did something. Upon believing the gospel, he cares for the physical wounds and the physical needs of Paul and Silas. So for Luke, the spiritual and the physical are always connected. The second you receive Jesus, the Jesus in you will start caring about people through you. That's why this whole idea, and it's a modern concept, that I love God, but I really don't like people, is not a Christian option. The Bible chips at that over and over again. It says, if you claim you love God but don't love people, you are a liar. You deceive yourself. The Bible could not speak in more strong terms concerning that. I've heard a lot of people say, I really like God, but I, I really love God, but I, I sure like dogs better than people. Everybody likes dogs better than people. <laughs> Everybody does, but we still need to love people. 
We still need to love people. And part of it is allowing Jesus to love them through us. Allowing him to love people through us. 32 through 34. They shared the word with him and all who lived in his household. He and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. I love that Luke adds this observation. The response of receiving the good news of Jesus Christ is rejoicing for everyone who receives it. We are joy spreaders. You share the good news and someone receives the good news, it is a season of rejoicing. I think people today have forgotten how to celebrate, so we've decided that celebrating's bad. You know, we, we live in a day where, you know, your, your favorite team wins a World Series or a Super Bowl, so everybody goes out in the street and sets cars on fire. Well, that's weird. <laughs> we don't know how to rejoice, partially because our society doesn't know how to rejoice sober. So you get a lot of people who don't make good decisions sober, get them drunk and see how they do. <laughs> but Christianity is, is a rejoicing faith. We are saved. We are saved. Uh, we are spreading good news. We need to rejoice. Our hearts need to be happy and not sad. And I think part of the problem with the Western church today is that we have this dour form of Christianity. Because we everybody's against us. Stop it. Everybody's not against you. Everybody's not against you. 99% of the world could care less about you one way or the other. So get over yourself. Everybody's not against you. But we're sharing good news. And when people receive that good news, there is rejoicing for us in the sharing. There's rejoicing for them in the receiving. And I think we just need to have some time to be happy. One of the things that is really interesting to me with the social media phenomenon, and social media has the opportunity to do some great good. For example, there's a revival going on at Asbury University right now. And there was another revival that happened decades ago there. The big difference is social media. Because we now live in a time where what's happening there can be communicated throughout the country instantly. People are sharing live videos. Uh, Reverend Carmen just got in her car and drove. You talk about a God chaser, right? She just got in her car and drove there. Uh, we've got some young people who are gonna be heading there. They just wanna see what's going on. They just wanna be there. But people are taking live videos so they can be a part of that. And so it allows folks to come in, but one of the social media downsides is that we kind of have this idea that, uh, that we've forgotten how to celebrate with people. People have something that happens in their life and it's good and they kind of put it out there and it makes everybody else feel crummy about themselves. Well, the reality is you all need some friends that you can celebrate with. And if you don't have any, I'd suggest making some new friends. Let's say you get a promotion at work. And you say, well, I can't really celebrate it at work. Everybody else is mad. I would get new friends. Hey, my dad has a great quote. We were eating breakfast one day. He goes, have I ever told you the story about? And I stopped him. I said, Dad, you've told me that story a hundred times. Have you ever thought about thinking before you tell a story as to whether or not you've told someone that story before? He goes, no, but I am thinking seriously about finding new friends. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. You know what? If you don't have people to rejoice with you, find some new friends. Find some new friends. If, if somebody's not happy, your kid made the honor roll, find some new friends. If something good's happened to you and you don't have anybody you can honestly share that with, find some new friends. And I hope they're Christian friends because we ought to be able to rejoice with each other. I'm rejoicing with Babette. God has touched her body and answered her prayers. When I said that, she was back here going like that. Uh, praise God. We need to rejoice. We need to rejoice. We need to rejoice. Why? Because we believe in God. Verse 35 through 37. The next morning, the prisoners were ordered to be released, but Paul refused to go. <laughs> you gotta like Paul. He said, we are Roman citizens who were publicly beaten and jailed without trial. Tell the city leaders to come and release us personally with an apology. 
Paul is a charmer, he is. The local authorities at Philippi had steered clear of a riot. Things were back under control. The ringleaders were incarcerated. There was no loss of life, which meant all of them would keep their jobs. Status quo seemed to be maintained. Always remember, bureaucracies exist to maintain the status quo. That's why they're so reluctant to embrace innovation, because it disrupts the status quo. So the authorities were hoping to whisk the troublemakers out of town, be done with the whole thing. They can take their followers with them. So orders were sent from the city magistrates to release the prisoner. And then the Philippian magistrates hit three significant snags. Number one, they discovered that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. That is a problem because of number two. Roman citizens cannot be beaten and incarcerated without formal charges and a trial. And number three, Paul and Silas had already been beaten and incarcerated. That is problematic. Roman citizenships for non-Romans was really, really expensive. And for two Jews like Paul and Silas, it would have been crazy expensive. That means their families came from money. That's how they were able to travel all of the time. That's why they were so well educated. So Roman citizenships were really expensive. That two itinerant Jewish exorcists, one of whom seemed to be perpetually in a bad mood, would be Roman citizens, would never have crossed these people's minds. The magistrates had to feel their stomachs cramping as they received this news. And the possible ramifications of their actions had to begin to dawn on them. Not offering due process to a Roman citizen got you fired at best. Possibly exiled, possibly killed. So they're in a bit of a conundrum. They formally release Paul and Silas from the jail. They beg them to go in peace. Paul refuses to leave. Of course he did. Because people are just going to be who they are. And that's who Paul is. Of course he did. So you have to ask yourself, is Paul being difficult or is Paul being strategic? And the answer is yes. (laughs) Had Paul tucked tail and left town, he would have exited his first city in Greece under duress, having the gospel formally discredited as anti-Roman because that was the charge in the streets. You can't recover from that kind of start. Very difficult. It's like you go play golf, and you get a 12 on the first hole, you might as well go home. You're not going to recover from a 12 unless you shoot 300 on an average 18, and then you're right on pace, all right? You seldom recover from that kind of start. The ministry in Greece would be over before it started, but if Paul received a public apology, Paul could put the devil on the defensive. No doubt that apology would be in writing and carried on Paul's person, Then you leave Philippi with something to build on. You give the new congregation there a fighting chance under Lydia and Luke. You keep the door open to one day return. So that's the play. Verses 38 through 40. When the city leaders found out Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They begged them to leave the city. Paul and Silas returned to Lydia's home, encouraged the believers, and then left town. Paul knew if he wanted to push this thing, the local magistrates would find themselves in far hotter water than he. However, he was in plenty of hot water himself. Everybody knew there was a bit of a uh, stalemate going on here. The authorities took the deal. Paul took the deal. But rather than leave Philippi immediately, he and Silas returned to Lydia's house They got some additional medical care. They set the strategic foundations for the Philippian church. They decided to leave Luke. They gathered up the evangelistic team and left Luke behind. And then, in their own good time, they on-ramped onto the highway called the Via Ignatia, and they took it west toward Thessalonica, modern Thessaloniki. So let's see what we can learn from the trailhead. Let's see what we can learn about evangelism, about Paul from the trailhead. If you're taking notes now, it's when you do it. Number one, there is a devil. Can I hear an amen from somebody? 
there is a devil. There is a devil. John 10.10 10 reminds us that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. When we step up, Satan pushes back. Always. Always. Many years ago, a young man who was a coach in the church came to Jesus, started coming to our church, and decided to step up in leadership in the church. Use his gifts for leadership. About two months later, we were uh, together, and he said to me, he said, Shane, I got to tell you, man, since I stepped up and started leading, my life's gotten worse, not better. I said, okay. And he goes, I'm not sure what to make of that. What do you think? I said, I want you to imagine something. Imagine that you are preparing to play a team you've already played twice this season in basketball, and you're going to have to hit them for a third time. And the first time you uh, play the team, there's a kid out there that does nothing. What do you do to prepare for him the next game? He goes, nothing. We got him contained. I said, right. I said, the second game, you do nothing to prepare for this kid. The kid scores 30 points, gets 10 rebounds. What are you going to do the next game? He goes, I'm going to put a man on it. He goes, he's on my radar screen now. I'm going to make sure that we shut him down and somebody else is going to have to beat us. I said, that's how Satan is. You spent most of your life no threat to Satan at all. Nobody guards basketball players who don't shoot, don't score, don't rebound, don't get assists, don't get steals. Nobody pays any attention to them. They just stand there. They just stand there. Nobody pays attention. You don't need a defense against that. There's nothing threatening about it. But if that player decides they're going to start cracking at it a little bit, all of a sudden, they got your attention. When you step up in leadership, when you decide you're going to start evangelizing, sharing your faith, you're going to get Satan's attention. So you just need to realize there is a devil. He will try to stop you. Alan Prass tells this great story many years ago. How many of you remember back in the days when we did knock and talks here at Christ Church? We would get brochures, put them in a little plastic container, and we would go all over the Metro East into neighborhoods. And at first we did what we called hang and runs. So we would just hang them on a doorknob and leave. That was it. Hang them on a doorknob and leave. And then we decided to up the ante and do knock and talks. And this was 10, 15 years ago. I wouldn't do it now. But 10 or 15 years ago, you'd knock on a door on a Saturday morning and you would say, hey, my name's Shane. Uh, I'm your neighbor. I live down the road and I go to Christ Church and I wanted to invite you to church. Do you have anything I, I could pray about with you? And Alan said he was really uncomfortable doing this, all right? And he said two of the first three houses he went to, they slammed the door in his face. And he said he was really tempted to go home. This was not going well. And he said, you know what? I made the decision that I was going to keep knocking and keep talking. And he said, I was treated wonderfully by every single person I encountered for the rest of the day. What happened? The devil tried to shut him down quick. Satan just tried to shut him down quick. But Alan didn't give in. And he worked through. So there is a devil when we step up, Satan pushes back. But I love what James says, resist the devil and he'll flee. I got all kinds of people, you know, they want to cast out devils and all this kind of stuff and, and, and all that and, and do what you need to do. But what James really says, if the devil's coming against you, resist and he will flee. How, what's, what's the resistance knocking on the fourth door? That's the resistance making that next invitation after the first one went poorly. That's the resistance there is a devil. Number two, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. We need to stop doing things in our own strength, and we need to evoke the power that exists in the name of Jesus Christ. I love it with this girl. Paul didn't spend four days and six hours performing an exorcism. He wasn't dancing around doing all kinds of incantations. He's doing none of that. He just cast a stinking devil out in the name of Jesus. Never flirt with evil. Do not get fixated on evil. Do not turn your attention to evil because it is a pit with no bottom. It always starts out good and it will expose itself as being demonic real quickly. So when you run into evil, and sometimes you will, and when you run into demon-possessed people, and sometimes you will, don't listen to the siren of evil. Don't tarry in your encounters with evil. Don't handle it yourself, but take authority over the situation in the name of Jesus and be done with it.
Be done with it. Number three, Paul suffered for Christ. Paul was arrested, beaten, and jailed. Paul fully expected that there would be a price extracted from him to share the good news. It was a price he paid over and over, and to his credit, he didn't whine about it. I don't know about you, but if I had to say one of the most annoying things in life to me are people who make decisions for themselves and then whine about them. I find those people horrifically annoying. You know? I I do. I I just find it really, really annoying. What I love about Paul, he goes into a city, he's going to share Jesus. Things go really, really bad. He may or may not have been beaten, arrested, jailed. And guess what he's doing at midnight? He's singing songs. You want to know why? Because Paul did not come to Philippi to not get arrested. He could have done that elsewhere. He came to Philippi to impact people for Jesus Christ. And at this point, he had to figure whatever mess he was in, that he was in it, he was going to have to pay a price for it, but good would come of it. And that gets us to number four. Paul knew that God was in charge. The earthquake hit when Paul and Silas were singing hymns in the prison. This isn't a coincidence. In reporting this story, Luke makes a clear statement. The Romans are not in charge. The Philippian authorities are not in charge. Python, the snake girl, is not in charge. And Paul is not in charge. God is in charge. God is in charge. And we need to realize he's got it. He's got this. Part of our belief as Christian people is that we believe the world is going somewhere. We do not believe that we are impersonal. You know, we don't believe we were created by an impersonal universe, by random forces. If so, our lives are utterly meaningless. We're just biological mutations who who live and die, and then somebody calls next until the whole thing blows up. Well, that's encouraging. We believe that we were created by the creator of the cosmos, We were created in his own image. He loves us, and we are here to serve a purpose of doing his will on the earth. Well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good stuff. And God's in charge. And we just need to realize control is an illusion. I've always known that. But you really know it when they hand you a pink slip, when your doctor says it's cancer when the irreconcilable differences are now legally irreconcilable, when the prodigal son or prodigal daughter leaves and you have no idea where they are and your heart's broken, I could go on and on and on. We're not in control, folks. We're not in control. You want to know what I have control over? I have control over my belief my actions, and my willingness to share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. And apart from that, I got nothing. I got nothing. But guess what I got? Plenty. God's in charge. Number five, Paul walked in God's timing. I've talked to you before. There's two Greek words for time. One is chronos. Chronos is a chronometer. It's, it's sequential time. What time is it? The other is kairos, and kairos is God's time. It's more like timing than time. So what we're really talking about, Paul walked in God's timing. When an earthquake shook the jail doors, Paul didn't just rush out in a dead sprint. And I think that's what we don't understand about Paul. We always think Paul should want to get away. Paul never was motivated by a desire to get away. He was always wanting to get in trouble and see what God did. Always. That was kind of his strategy. But he believed that he walked in God's timing. And he is willing to live in the God time. He's willing to trust God for the outcome, regardless of his situation. Number six, Paul knew his rights. Paul knew the law. He leveraged it to further spreading the gospel. Can I, some of you, you're going to walk away from this, and this is what you're going to remember tonight. Christian is not a synonym for doormat. Christian is not a synonym for capitulation. Never has been. I remember when the pandemic was hit and the government was telling everybody what to do. 
And that's what governments love, is to tell people what to do. And I remember the very first echoes that they were going to mandate that churches could not be open for live worship. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I feel like God called our church to open. And now I'm hearing that if a church is open, that there's going to be severe consequences. And the next thing that crossed my mind is why would that change anything? Why would I possibly think that I should go my whole life as a Christian leader and not once get cross-threaded with authorities when Paul did it every three minutes? So I called a local pastor of a very, very large church, and I said, hey, what you going to do? Because we'd been talking. He goes, uh, I'm going to open anyway. What you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to open anyway. I said, you do realize there's an outside chance we may be singing hymns in a jail at midnight on Sunday, don't you? He said, yeah. And you know what? I figure if we had, earthquake might have just come and shook the doors wide open. Uh, Paul knows rights. We need to know what's there. You know, Craig LaCroix has been to Mardi Gras so many times, and so many of, of these men have gone on this trip. And sometimes you're in crazy situations, you know, because if you think about it, all Mardi Gras is in New Orleans, particularly as you get closer to Fat Tuesday, is a bit of a controlled riot, right? It's just packed in there. There's, there's crowd think. It's, it's really its own kind of thing. But I can remember so many times on those trips where the police would walk up to us and said, you can't be here. You can't be here. And what I'd always say was, well, where can we be? And every single time they said, you can be there, but you can't be here. Okay, we'll go there. But I was always had in the back of my mind that one of these times they may say, you can't go anywhere. And at that point, I needed to realize that as an American, I have a right to stand in public space. I have a right to stand. And I also have a First Amendment right to proclaim my faith. And we do have some sense of freedom of religion here, even if people aren't crazy about it. So you tell me where to stand. And when I do, I'm going to talk about John 3, 16 and 17. And if you tell me I can't stand anywhere, then we're going to be at a little bit of a loggerhead, right? It could be at a little bit of a loggerhead. I'm just saying there has to be a point at which you're willing to stand, even if Caesar tells you you can't stand anymore. At some point, either God has the final word or Caesar has the final word. And uh, if you're going to be an evangelist and with, with Paul, God always got the final word. He always got the final word. I remember when we opened, uh, somebody chipped at me. Boy, I can't tell you how popular that was. But somebody chipped at me, and they said, they said, you ought to follow the law. I said, I'm sure glad Paul didn't. Our Christianity would have been contained to a minor sect of Judaism in Jerusalem. I'm really glad that Paul decided he was going to share the gospel, even when he was told he couldn't. You know our Christian brothers and sisters in communist lands in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and 80s, they shared faith and met together like this in jeopardy of prison every single time they got together. People who had the tenacity and calling to be leaders, many of them spent years incarcerated in places like Russia and China and East Germany. Uh, why would we think we would never pay a price for our Christianity? Why would we possibly think that? So we need to know our rights. And at times... Uh, not at times, every time. I'm thankful to live in a country where I have a few rights. I am. I'm, I'm grateful to live here. Number seven, Paul sang in the storm. Some of you are going through a rough stretch of highway tonight. You know, a misunderstood, run into a bad piece of luck, beaten, jailed, and chained to the wall, Paul, might be a perfect metaphor for what you're going through. Uh, it's been a tough week at Christ Church. We've had a death of one of the, uh, just, just one of the true founders and fixtures in our church. We've had a tragic death this week. 
I've had so many people who have lost mothers and, and fathers. It just seems like it's been a, a tough week. May I offer some advice? Sing. Sing. You don't feel it? Sing anyway. Sing anyway. Sing in the prison at midnight. Sing even though the other prisoners are trying to sleep. Sing even though the warden's telling you to shut up. Sing until the chains fall off. Sing until God comes through. And then sing because he did. Sing because God is in control and not the circumstances that encompass you. I am convinced that a song of praise offered to God in duress is a song that is sung in defiance of the evil powers of this world. You want the victory? Sing it. Sing it. Navigation tools are necessary for anybody traversing the unknown. Paul's primary navigational tool was the Holy Spirit. And Paul had a pretty interesting strategy. He'd get himself into really bad trouble and he'd trust God to get him out. That was it. Paul trusted the Holy Spirit to guide him into getting things right, like go to Greece. And then he even trusted the Holy Spirit to guide him when maybe he got something wrong, like casting a demon out of a girl just because he was frustrated. Paul was the greatest evangelist in the history of the world. And despite himself at times, he relied on the Holy Spirit. And I want to suggest to you that we must do the same. We must do the same. We must learn to rely on on the Holy Spirit. We must learn to trust God more than we trust ourselves. And we must learn to trust the Bible more than the cultural narratives that encapsulate us. So with that, our prelude to our trek has concluded. Next week, drum roll please, we are actually gonna start Philippians. Only a month in to a study on <laughs> Philippians. And we're going to see for ourselves how God forges sinners into saints, the downtrodden into victors, and the weak into witnesses. So great is our God that he can do incredible things through people, flawed people like you and me. Isn't God awesome? Isn't God awesome? A part of what we're doing here at church is called 500. Over the next three weeks, I'm going to be looking for 500 evangelists who agree to invite one new person to church per week for 60 weeks. That will result in 30,000 warm invitations to church over 60 weeks. One in 10 of those invitations are normally met with a visit, 3,000. And one in 10 visitors normally plug into our church, 300. So, I'm looking for 500 people to overcome their fear and to say, I'm, I'm in. We're going to teach you how to do this. We're going to equip you. We're going to teach you. We're going to invest in you. Take this Bible studies. Uh, read my book. But we're going to equip you to do this. We're not gonna, it's not going to be like a Rambo exercise where they drop in behind enemy lines and say, good luck, kid. It's not going to be like that, all right? We're going to equip you. But what I can't do is I can't say yes for you. And I know it's intimidating. So far, we've had 130 people sign up. That's it. 130 people in four days. So if you were hoping other people would constitute the 500 and let you off the hook, hasn't happened. And I'm gonna tell you, I don't think it's looking good. I need you to say yes to God. You don't have to have the faith to know how you're gonna do it, but you do have to have the faith to start. Right outside the doors on your way out, Lauren is going to be at a table. It's going to have these 500 brochures. And there's simply a sign-up sheet. And I'm just going to ask you to put your name on the line. Say, I will be one of the 500. I'll be one. We'll step out in faith. Learn to listen to the Holy Spirit and just see what God can do through me. I'm convinced that a bad witness is better than no witness. And I'm convinced that a good witness is better than a bad witness. So why don't we learn how to be good witnesses? Why don't we learn how to be good witnesses? And why don't we learn how to do that together? And why don't we learn how to hear the Holy Spirit? And why don't we just see what God is getting ready to do at Christ Church and how God might use this church as an evangelistic wing of a Holy Spirit movement 
that I believe is encompassing this country just as we speak. God, if you want to unleash a movement in America, Christ Church is in, and we're volunteering. We're volunteering to be the evangelistic wing. Thank you, guys, for the joy of preaching the word to you, sharing the word. Thank you in advance for signing up. Got to tell you one last story. After early church on Sunday, I kind of made my appeal. I got back into my office, and I usually look on Facebook to see who's checked in and and what people are saying and all those kind of things. And I had a, a direct message on Facebook. And it's from somebody who I don't know if they were here or they watched online, I'm not sure. But somebody said, hey, I just want you to know I'm in, period. And then it said, I also want you to know I'm an introvert. And I get really stressed when I have even casual conversations with anybody. And with the exception of my family and one or two close friends, this is absolutely terrifying to me. I want you to know this is gonna be really hard, but I'm in, exclamation point. And then she included one of those green puke emojis. (laughs) One of those green emojis where something's puking. And I thought, okay, I'm in. She's in. Now I only need 498. (laughs) Jump into this. See what God can do through people like us.